Hello, everybody. It's truly a pleasure to cover with you uh, our initial le lesson and continuous glucose monitoring for type 2 diabetes. And as you can see here, the sub subtitle, not just for type 1 diabetes anymore, because this technology uh, definitely has a lot of benefit for a very broad range of patients, as I hope uh, you will um, see during uh, these lessons. In addition, uh, during this um, lesson, we will explain in, in detail how to use continuous glucose monitoring or CGM technology, um, their main principle, uh, how to apply it and wear it, as well as um, in what situation is best suited. And then we will also discuss link be between uh, use of CGM um, data to help uh, guide uh, lifestyle dietary modification as well as medication management and there are basically um, also some disclosures with respect to research grant from Dex uh, Dexcom that Dr. Richardson has received. Uh, and with that, let's get started. I also like to say that um, when we have developed these lessons, um, the assumption was made that majority of uh, people will be less familiar with this technology. So for some of you, the information may um, look basic. However, I think that uh, everybody can benefit of a refreshment. So let's look here at um, this um, um, this slide that basically set the stage because in fact, when someone checks his or her blood sugars with a finger stick, this is just the tip of the iceberg. In reality, uh, the number of uh, glucose changes, uh, it's so much broader that the finger stick cannot cover. So here, side by side on the left, you see the, you know, a typical blood glucose meter, which will allow a patient to measure a blood glucose at a given time. It is from capillary blood but doesn't show actually any particular trends. So it will not um, predict whether the blood glucose is falling or it's rising, it's just one moment in time. Whereas the continuous glucose monitoring or the CGM technology, which is shown here on the right uh, slide, has uh, a much more comprehensive um, approach in which not only monitoring this blood glucose um, uh, values uh, anywhere between a five to 15 minutes interval, but also allowing you or your patient to see trends and to predict uh, changes in, in blood glucose in um, the next um, time intervals. So here are some of the limitations of the traditional glycemic measures. And by no means, I'm not saying that meters are not good. However, as I mentioned earlier, they are providing an information at a given time. Um, they can be also painful, sometimes burdensome patients will complain about uh, numbness in their fingertips for so many times uh, pricking their finger and will not allow a quite comprehensive picture, even if someone may check their blood sugar six or seven times a day. It is true also that as shown on the right, we have other measures of assessing you know, glucose control and um, a classical one, which is the hemoglobin A1C, which is um, basically a measure that gives us information on the estimated average blood glucose over the past three months. It is, however, uh, a value that being an average or a mean will not provide information whether um, there were a lot of uh, blood sugars in, in the low range or the high range, as the mean may be um, look quite uh, uh, good when in reality uh, patients may present with a lot of episodes of hypo or hyperglycemia. And there are a variety of conditions, including some blood cell um, um, disorders, um, such as some forms of hemoglobinopathies or conditions in which the red blood cell turnover is much uh, shorter, such as um, for instance, dialysis or left ventricular assist devices or after a blood transfusion when the A1C may not be so accurate. 
So let's now go step by step and review what is a continuous glucose monitoring. So the continuous monitoring technology involves um, a sensor that is worn under the skin uh, and reads um, the glucose in the interstitial fluid. And we will go over that uh, principle in the next slide. Uh, it uh, does, um, obviously it's like a computer clearly, uh, and has a possibility to use an integrated system of uh, values, uh, blood glucose values, arrows and graphs to indicate trends and direction of blood glucose changes over time. Uh, this sampling of glucose, it's automatically happening, as I mentioned, at five to 15 minutes interval, and that is happening continuously, regardless whether the patient is awake or asleep, or whether it's doing certain activities. And thus, uh, it uh, offers a very nice view on a patient uh, blood glucose patterns uh, during the 24 hours, and then, of course, during the time frame that um, that particular download is being shown. And most recently, uh, all of these technologies uh, have uh, Bluetooth capabilities and can be uh, seen on a patient's smartphone. So uh, using the actual uh, reader or scanner associated with each of these um, um, uh, CGMs, it's not a prerequisite. I mentioned how is uh, the principle here is, uh, as you can see the sensor, it's a really a very tiny uh, filament which is usually about uh, 0.3 millimeter or three microns uh, that it's being inserted under the skin. Um, and here is the interstitial fluid where the uh, glucose is being measured. And uh, one needs to remember that uh, there is true, the glucose uh, diffuses from this capillary uh, uh, blood into the interstitial fluid. So therefore a certain lag time um, between um, this process to occur is expected. So what I'm trying to say is that if one would check a blood glucose with a finger prick with a meter and compare at the same time with the CGM, a certain difference between these two value is expected because there is a delay in the interstitial uh, glucose of, you know, between 10, 15 or even 20 minutes. So to summarize what we've been discussing here is are the CGM component. Um, this is the screen with the actual glucose reading and that particular time that is shown quite clearly. But besides that um, uh, value, one can see a trend. In other words, that's showing that this blood glucose is raising. And when that raise, it's pretty um, uh, fast. There are even two arrows ver vertical up, or the arrows could be down. Again, the numbers of arrows and the uh, slope uh, giving uh, a patient information on the uh, predicted time that that change may occur. Then uh, there is this actual sensor that is being inserted under the skin. And then a patient can also see the targets of, of the desired blood glucose um, um, to be maintained. There are several, uh, obviously, CGM uh, available now, and the most used are uh, the sensor uh, Dexcom G6 and the uh, Libre uh, View from Abbott. And here are some examples of how the sensors look like and how they should um, be um, uh, unveiled from their package and then uh, inserter. Here is the transmitter from from the Dexcom, and here it's an, an image of a scanner from the Libre view or the view on a telephone on smartphone. The insertion of the CGM, it's a very important step as each of these CGM have their own special inserter. Uh, it's pretty easy, in fact, once the skin is prepped, and I like to highlight that the preparation of the skin, it's a very important process to avoid uh, the sensors to falling down earlier than um, uh, uh, they should uh, with prepping the skin with soap and water prior and then disinfecting with alcohol and uh, with skin tack wipes that are shown here are important steps and then trying to keep the uh, 
um, surface uh, where the sensor is inserted, as you can see here, uh, the upper arm or the abdomen as uh, flat as possible when the insertion is applied with the right pressure, then um, in general, uh, the sensor do not fall. There is a tiny needle, obviously, that's retracting it immediately after the sensor is being inserted. And um, uh, we already um, uh, have discussed about the most important areas where uh, this can be worn. Majority of patients, because both the Libre and the Dexcom are so small, have been wearing those on their arms lately. And um, a little bit of a difference between the um, flash CGM, which is the Libre view, and the continuous is the flash requires this scanning, uh, either with the reader or with the telephone at a pre-specified time, but definitely no longer than eight hours in order for the information to uh, remain uh, stored here um, in, in, in the reader, uh, whereas the Dexcom um, has continuous data that it's being sent in real time without the patient needing to scan. So with that introduction, or you know, after reviewing the basics, I think that one of the most important components of these lessons is to try to unveil the benefit of CGM use in patients with type 2 diabetes. And we already discussed a little bit about the limitations of uh, the hemoglobin A1C as a measure of glucose control. Uh, remains a very important, obviously, measures. However, as is highly illustrated in these graphs, is that, in fact, an A1C of 8% um, can be, in fact, um, uh, you know, um, can be in fact associated with very different uh, patterns of glucose on a daily basis. And as you can see here, on the upper part, the patient definitely has a lot of peaks and valleys, in other words, hyper and hypoglycemic events. But, you know, because it's a mean, the average may uh, sound um, quite, um, you know, benign. Eight, it's not ideal, but you may say it's not too bad either. But in reality, this patient spends a lot of time in dangerously low blood glucose and also dangerously high blood glucose. Uh, similarly, this other subject here has the same A1C of eight, and definitely he spends a lot of time in higher blood glucose, but no low. So thus, the average is, is the same. Uh, definitely uh, therapeutic decisions um, will be very different uh, when one want, want to optimize glucose control in patient number one versus patient number two. Um, we have alluded also that up until um, recently, it has been uh, considered that uh, truly only patients with type 1 diabetes would benefit of using this technology because they definitely have to take a lot of insulin. And even when they are on pumps, the risk of hypoglycemia remains pretty high. Uh, the glucose variability is pretty high. Uh, uh, but in reality, um, in fact, any patient who has diabetes would benefit of this technology. Uh, first of all, there are patients who are treated with agents who can cause hypoglycemia, like for instance, sulfonylurea agents or insulin, and insulin will always cause hypoglycemia. Uh, and in addition, this technology is emerging as a very important tool in guiding and also helping people to change lifestyles. For instance, if we look at this um, recording here on the right, um, uh, you know, a patient may sleep through uh, episodes of lows, mild hypoglycemia, you know, above 50, maybe completely um, asymptomatic when one is asleep. However, that doesn't mean that it cannot cause problems and complications. The same here, um, uh, we can see episodes of hypo, hyperglycemia, particularly as it seems to be associated with meals. So um, we and others have been uh, heavily involved in several research studies uh, in which we demonstrated that in fact, CGMs have benefits in patients with type 2 diabetes, and 
um, you know, some of the patients who have been enrolled in these studies have been uh, communicating with us uh, their uh, feelings and their impression. And for instance, this patient, James, um, stated that I like it because I can check my blood sugar at any time. Uh, I am more aware of what I'm eating. And uh, is it like turning a light for me? My blood sugars used to be in the 350. Now they are much lower. So definitely, um, um, and we will share with you some of the data, the CGM have been shown to reduce both A1C levels as well as time spent in hypoglycemia and incidence of hypoglycemia. And by having a chance to look at these various patterns, uh, we can then make therapeutic decisions um, that would be personalized to that particular patient. However, one needs to understand that there are some limitations uh, to this technology as with everything else. Definitely, they cannot be used with MRI CTs, for instance. So if one uh, patient would require such imaging procedures, I think it would be important to time the procedures when a sensor is about to be uh, changed, but that it's something that can be easily done with counseling and education. Um, it is very important that both providers um, and particularly patients are well trained. Um, and the training, it's not complicated, but everybody needs to understand how the technology works, how the sensor have to be inserted so they do not fall, how to prep. And most importantly, to teach patients to look at the information that is relevant, not only at that specific blood glucose at time, X, but looking at patterns, trends, and particularly those arrows that can predict whether a blood glucose may drop very fast or may raise very fast. Um, so, and, and of course, one needs still uh, to uh, acknowledge that insurance coverage is not universal yet, and these technologies are not expensive, are not cheap, are expensive. Um, there are still um, questions regarding whether patients will require to prick their fingers and a majority of the systems available uh, uh, right now may not require calibrations with finger stick. Some still do, but uh, with the um, uh, changes in technology and their continuous improvement um, very soon, uh, uh, all of the CGM devices will no longer require calibrations. However, even when a calibration is not required, one needs to understand that this technology have a time, a lag time until they can properly display glucose because it uh, requires a time to learn to detect glucose and understand particularly patterns. So usually there are a couple of hours from the moment a new sensor is inserted until the values are displayed and can be relied upon. So I like to share with you a quite exciting uh, piece of evidence that we have recently uh, obtained. This was a very large trial in which we randomized patients with type 2 diabetes who were on one injection of basal insulin as well as other um, options for glucose lowering other uh, agents, but they had to be at least on, uh, on basal insulin. This was a randomized trial, um, um, a parallel group in which we randomized these patients to either wear a CGM uh, uh, and obviously use the CGM report that, that were used by the providers enrolled in this trial to make decision in medication changes or use the traditional blood glucose meter uh, finger stick. And we randomized them in two to, uh, to one uh, fashion, patients with type two diabetes, as I said, uh, at least basal insulin and a variety of other agents and an A1C between seven H to 11.5. Uh, people who were on the meter, they also had an opportunity to wear a blinded CGM at three months interval. Uh, and with that report, we were able to actually look at their uh, patterns as well. 
and we um, looked primarily at the A1C change after eight months, that was the primary outcome, but we also look at incidence of hypoglycemia timing range and so uh, so far. And here is the study design. As you can see here at baseline, the groups were pretty balanced with an average A1C of about nine. Uh, and um, this is just a summary of the results, but to, uh, to make the story shorter, uh, not only that the A1C at eight months in those who were randomized to CGM was significantly lower, they also spent significantly more time in this time in target range um, that it's um, 70 to 180. Most importantly, they spend significantly less time in uh, low under 70. We will have um, uh, a lot of time when we will discuss the time in range during session number two and also understand why this range has been established as optimal range or target range for uh, control or blood uh, glucose. In addition, after eight months, and this is not shown on this slide, um, those people who were uh, randomized to the BGM group were um, randomized back to CGM, and those who were on the CGM were split in half, half continue on CGM, and half uh, were uh, returned to the meter. And in fact, uh, those who returned to the meter, unfortunately, uh, lost the beneficial changes with the CGM, whereas those of uh, people who were on the meter and who were randomized to CGM in the second uh, part of the trial uh, had also seen the same benefit in reduction in A1C and reduction time in hypoglycemia. So based on that, uh, obviously, uh, many of the insurers are changing and are extending coverage, and we will discuss about coverage uh, uh, today also towards the end of this lesson. But for your information, when considering who may benefit and who also could have a high chance to have this technology approved, our patients who obviously have um, type 2 diabetes are overweight, are gaining weight, um, and you see that they require higher and higher insulin dosing, uh, and yet in spite the A1C goes up and the weight goes up, uh, people who have a high incidence of hypoglycemia, as well as people who are decided to try to make lifestyle modification, including changing and reducing the overall carbohydrates intake, uh, are good candidates. And uh, again, this is another participant in one of our trial who had been uh, very happy uh, and his quality of life has changed after have been given the opportunity uh, to use the CGM. So let's look now uh, from a patient perspective and also how to use this technology to stimulate and to maintain lifestyle modification because uh, definitely when one has an opportunity to see these blood glucose trends, uh, one becomes more aware of uh, diet and could more easily change uh, particularly some uh, food intakes or quantity intakes based on those peaks that can be observed then in real life by reducing glucose, obviously, and reducing uh, food intake, one will need less insulin. Less insulin will lead to weight loss, less hypoglycemia, and that will actually close a beneficial cycle here with a positive feedback that will drive uh, behavior change. Uh, it is also important that with this new technology, one doesn't need to stick to the old dogma that a patient with diabetes needs to eat three meals and two snacks. Um, in fact, that would add for many of people who are sedentary, who may have other comorbidities and not move, moving on a quite high amount of calories that are not needed because when you have the CGM that will alert you on those changes, you don't need to eat at night just to prevent the blood glucose to fall. You can make adjustments in medication um, and um, 
and that would prevent the glucose to fall or if the glucose would truly fall you will get all this notification in real time thus one can take action only when it's needed this is uh, another patient story uh, from a CGM. Uh, this was actually uh, um, a study in which patients were not treated with insulin, but we used the technology to try to make lifestyle changes and implement uh, different diets, uh, particularly uh, reducing the amount of carbohydrates in one uh, diet. As you can see here, this patient, for instance, before I started the study, I ate out of boredom um, and I rarely ate because I was hungry because I didn't let myself to get hungry. It didn't matter how much sleep I got the night before, every day after lunch, I became so tired and I found that I needed caffeine to make, uh, make it through the day. But by wearing the CGM and seeing the reports, um, then I realized and it kept me mindful of what I was eating help me to understand why was my, my body reacted the way it does. And let's look at some of these examples here. As you can see here at the beginning of the study, um, there are clear peaks. Here is the breakfast, bowl of cereal, cup of coffee. Um, the cereal, in fact, has a lot of carbohydrates and it not only has a lot of carbohydrates, but these carbohydrates have a high glycemic index, so it will raise your blood glucose quite a lot. And here it's another big peak after eating two hamburgers for dinner. But seeing that, then the patient uh, is becoming more conscious. Uh, see in real time how much damage a bowl of cereal, for instance, or a hamburger does to your blood sugar. It's a good incentive to try to, to change that diet. And, and indeed, um, uh, this person successfully um, was able to change the diet to um, increase the amount of protein, reduce carbohydrates, and uh, several weeks later, as you can see here, um, the uh, blood glucose pattern are much flatter. There, there are still some small fluctuations, and then by writing down um, their uh, food intake, they can further dissect which of, of these various meal um, or food items could be further reduced. Um, this is um, now an example in which you can see um, the sensor one, it's before, um, and then sensor two, it's after a session uh, of coaching um, this particular subject on a lower carbohydrates uh, diet. Um, in general, um, for instance, in this case, as you can see here, there was a lot of hypoglycemia, particularly overnight, that can be um, um, addressed by reducing insulin if people are taking insulin or sulfonylureas that are the two uh, main classes that will produce uh, will um, induce hypoglycemia. Uh, and then, as you can see here, these trends are much more um, uh, appropriate in this gray uh, time with much less hypoglycemia. In general, if a patient truly wants to engage in a low carb diet, uh, we recommend at least a 50% reduction in uh, the insulin dose if a patient is on insulin. So let's look as a, at a particular case. Here it's Steve, 57 year old male, obese, BMI 44, A1C 8.3 has additional comorbidities such as depression, hypertension, sleep apnea, testosterone insufficiency, which could be a relative in, in such a patient who is obese, and we are not going to go into that right now. He has uh, been treated prior to uh, coming to us with a combination of exenatide, which is an earlier generation glucagon-like peptide 1 receptor agonist, glyburide, which is a sulfonylurea, and insulin glargine 35 units at night, as well as metformin twice daily. He also had been receiving aspirin, atorvastatin, and uh, uh, propranolol. So this patient already, however, had a, a scare um, given his high cardiovascular risk and was trying to cut down the starch prior to seeing us. 
uh, and he also wanted to engage in more exercise, but then um, realized that um, had been experiencing um, episodes of low blood sugars during nighttime and during daytime. And this is the first CGM report. So you see here clearly spending many nights in long periods of, of hypoglycemia, uh, which is worrisome in somebody like Steve, uh, clearly ticking bomb from a cardiovascular perspective, high risk of arrhythmia or other cardiovascular complications. And that's based on the patient desire to further engage in exercise and um, dietary changes. The uh, gliburide was cut in half, the insulin was reduced um, uh, proportionally based on uh, how much exercise and, and um, uh, dietary modification and the insulin reduction can be also done in an active fashion by teaching patients to continue to reduce if they still see hypoglycemia. So for instance, in this case, the glargine was reduced to 25 from 35 and then further reduced to 18. Uh, and as you can see already, important changes, much less hypoglycemia, but not completely zero. Uh, and much, uh, uh, much more blunted pattern of glucose after his meals. And as you can see here now, his meals are um, string cheese, omelet, spinach, tomato, onion, uh, trail mix, chicks and broccoli soup, celery and hummus. So very little carbs and blueberries and milk, but not a lot of carbs. Uh, further reduction in insulin was done after seeing this episode of hypoglycemia to 18 units. With all these changes, uh, Steve was able also to lose weight, uh, initially 10 pounds. Uh, the new fasting blood glucose uh, was um, reduced to 90 A1C. It's much lower now. Um, in this case, uh, the PCP uh, reduced glargine but, uh, and reduced um, gliburide even further. Um, and at some point, uh, you know, with uh, patients who are really engaged um, in both diet and exercise, insulin, for instance, could be completely discontinued, particularly since we do have now um, at our uh, disposal use of medications that have additional benefit from a cardiorenal perspective as you will learn in, in the lessons looking at sodium glucose transporter inhibitor and glucagon-like receptor agonist. So to put side by side and summarize, here are the manufacturer of the CGM uh, currently um, that are available in this country. It's Abo Freestyle, uh, uh, the Dexcom, Medtronic, uh, G3, uh, and more recently G4 that um, can um, um, is usually used with the Medtronic pumps. Metronic CGM is not yet approved by itself as a durable medical equipment as uh, the Libre Freestyle and the Dexcom are. And then there is the Eversense, which is a sensor that it's inserted basically under the skin. It requires an incision um, and insertion and can monitor blood glucose initially for three, then six, and even nine months uh, are available. But because the easiest to use in a general practice, uh, very easy to insert and also covered uh, under durable medical equipment are the Freestyle and the Dexcom. Those are the one that we will concentrate mostly um, in our lessons. So if we compare them um, uh, side by side, uh, the reading frequency between the Freestyle uh, 14 day, which was the initial system approved, the Libre 2, which is now available and approved, um, and the Libre Pro, which is a professional version that does not allow the patient to see the data. It's usually um, mainly used for research these days. And then the Dexcom. So as you can see, the readings of the glucose are at 15 minutes with the uh, Freestyle and Libre 2, and at five minutes with the G6. The sensor where it's 14 days for the Freestyle and Libre 2 and 10 days for the Dexcom. None of them require calibration. Uh, all can have optional calibration, although the Freestyle Libre do not need even that. Oh, sorry about that. 
okay? And then um, that this so-called warm-up period um, is, um, uh, you know, shown as an, an hour or two hours, but in reality, uh, it's good to advise patients to wait at least two and three hours because the longer the time, the more accurate these predictions are. It's, you know, it's a learning algorithm um, that requires a little bit of time. The Libra 2 that it's now available and the Dexcom all have active alarms. They can be set to predict either high blood glucose, but mostly are used for predicting low blood glucose because if we uh, put too many alarms in place there and in the settings, then uh, patients will um, easily get alerts fatigues and that could be also stressful. And then the transmitter, it's built with the sensor for the Freestyle and Libre 2, and then requires a change at 90 day with the Dexcom G6. Here it's Bluetooth technology um, and for Libre 2 near field and Bluetooth. Here are some of the uh, platforms that allow, um, uh, allow us to um, see patient data and we will have a step-by-step -step approach during session number two but here it's for your information here it's the freestyle libre or libre view system uh, where um, a practice can establish the, uh, the account and then uh, obviously invite patients to share their uh, data and then you can access your patient data um, whenever um, uh, you would like either to see the patient in, in person or as a virtual visit. And here it's the clarity system from Dexcom. Uh, this is the actual view of the platform. But as I mentioned, we will go over the detailed steps on how to uh, establish the accounts and sharing patient data in uh, session number two like to say a couple of words about insulin pumps and closed loop systems since the CGM technology became so reliable and so accurate, definitely it has been incorporated in the semi closed loop systems. And there are currently two that are FDA approved. One is the Medtronic uh, system and one is the Tandem with the T-Slim and the Dexcom G6. And this uh, system are shown in here. And definitely there is a continuous insulin delivery made based on the readings of the CGM, the prediction of glucose changes, as well as the active insulin um, um, at a certain moment. Um, so what are some of the pros and cons? Um, so uh, the Libres, uh, 12, uh, 14 days or Libre 2 are pretty uh, um, inexpensive okay so they are definitely cheaper than the uh, Dexcom uh, they do not um, require calibrations um, the Libre 14 days didn't have alarms but the Libre 2 does have optional alarms and uh, for instance for the Libre 2 although the integration with the iPhones it's available with the iOS or the Android smartphone, that app, it's not yet available, but I think it will be pretty soon. Um, whereas the Dexcom also no calibration, has active alarms, has continuous reading, no scanning required, but it's the most expensive. Here are some of the costs associated with these various uh, CGMs at various suppliers, either at Costco, CVS, Walgreens, uh, Meyer, Kroger, um, and um, approximate cost for 12 weeks across various pharmacies. And as you can see here, the price of the sensors uh, and transmitters for freestyle sensors for Dexcom and then transmitters. So as you can see, price fluctuates and um, they are not uh, quite cheap. Um, it is also important to know how to order this technology. Uh, definitely, um, um, we are going to try to uh, offer you some tips um, in very vast majority of cases. Uh, up until recently, ordering a CGM would require establishing DME um, uh, accounts. Uh, but many of the pharmacies, as, as you could see in the uh, prior slide, 
could dispense EGM as well, particularly if uh, when patients pick their insurance plans. And since we are somewhat in the open enrollment now, I think it's important to um, advise our patients on how to pick their pharmacy benefits if they have CGM as a pharmacy benefits. Uh, prescribing this technology is um, much easier for you and also for the patients. So, um, of course, each health plan has different coverage policies. Um, and, um, and then uh, the same is true whether it's covered under a DME or under a pharmacy benefits. To exemplify what I'm saying, it's here um, um, some of the criteria of the coverage by insurer. Um, here is the Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan Blue Care Network, particularly if a patient has this selected as a pharmacy benefit. Um, a patient can get the CGM covered with only uh, a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes, doesn't require to be an insulin, doesn't require to check a number of times a day. Uh, but if it's ordered to a DME vendor, then there are more coverage criteria. The same is true for priority health, I would be able to prescribe a CGM at the pharmacy with only a type 2 diabetes diagnosis. However, other um, plans, including uh, Medicare, do have quite uh, restrictive criteria still to date, uh, number of injection of insulin, monitoring, although the monitoring from Medicare has been removed, especially after we finished this mobile trial. It also required some other conditions like appointments, and currently Medicaid, it's not covering for type 2 diabetes, although we are working very hard to be collaborative to improve uh, this coverage across the entire spectrum of uh, insurers uh, and hopefully also uh, Medicaid. And with that, thank you so much for your attention and I'm happy to take questions. Hello everybody again. It is truly a pleasure to discuss with you now the lesson number two on uh, the continuous glucose monitoring in type 2 diabetes. As we've discussed it during the first lesson, uh, we'll cover additional uh, components that will uh, show you that uh, this technology is not just for patients with type 1 diabetes anymore. We would like to remind you the uh, learning objectives of this lesson, of this lesson and particularly uh, we will um, discuss today how to look at the CGM data and understand the most important component of the reports that are being generated and also uh, overview the uh, CGM uh, data um, in um, conjunctions with uh, and coupled with diet, exercise log, as well as other medication. This is a fresh reminder of um, the uh, uh, type of continuous glucose monitoring that are available currently on the market. We've discussed during the first lesson about these various technologies, one on the left, the uh, Abbott Libre uh, view, Ab Abbott Libre, the Dexcom, uh, as well as the Medtronic and the Eversense sensors. But as we have covered during that time, these tech uh, two um, technologies are not um, so easily used in, in clinical practice and Medtronic. It's not yet approved as a durable medical equipment. Thus, we will mainly review today pertinent information with respect to the Abbott Libre and the Dexcom G6. So let's go now over some practical tips on how the data from the CGM by, worn by the patient can be uh, uploaded and then reviewed. There are several uh, online platforms that are currently available. One is obviously uh, produced by the Dexcom that it's called Clarity and the other one by the Abbott, the Libre View. Uh, they both generate reports that incorporate uh, the raw data from these continuous glucose monitoring device, uh, devices and they are viewable on the websites um, uh, 
for both uh, patients and uh, the patient care team. Uh, the reports can be downloaded as PDFs and uh, easily uploaded in your respective electronic medical record or EMR. There are also possibility to download the CSV files if you really want to look at the large um, um, file with uh, numbers, but that is mainly used um, in some research projects. So here are the two platforms on top. It's the Dexcom um, um, Clarity and on the bottom it's the Libre View. They are very similar with some uh, small differences, but this is basically how you could uh, create your own account and then have uh, your patients that follow with you data there as files and uh, each time the new uh, data is being refreshed, uh, additional information is available to you. But let's, um, let's review now a little bit more in depth how this data can be available to you. As you can see here, side by side, the Abbott Freestyle Libre 14 days, which was the first generation of, of the Abbott CGM, and now with the Libre 2 and Dexcom G6. Uh, all three have the same component in each. Initially, you need to invite a patient um, with a unique sharing code uh, so that they can share the data. Uh, so this is a basically an example of how you enter the patient information, generate the unique code so that they can uh, start accepting to share data. Now, uh, the patient then uh, will either send the clinic um, in response a sharing invite, and this is an example for the Dexcom Clarity app that will um, uh, be uh, viewed to you, or uh, for the Libre view, the clinic established um, uh, the practice ID that will allow the patient to share this uh, remote data. So there are sm small differences between, between the two platforms. And then, of course, there is always the possibility that when patients are being seen in person, once you have your account, with this various dashboard, their devices can be directly downloaded when they come to the clinic and then automatically the report is generated and can be directly uploaded into the EMR. But um, so basically this is the workflow, uh, as you can see here. Um, as a summary, the patient uploads the CGM data, um, on the website, or you know, they are already sharing their data with the clinic at subsequent visits. Here is the medical assistant that downloads the CGM report, uploads it into the EMR, and then when the provider is ready to start the visit, all that information is available for you to look at, uh, evaluate trends, and make a decision. Uh, we would like to also remind you that um, the MCT2T is available um, to give you additional resources. Uh, um, and there are definitely the videos that are created by each of these um, industry uh, makers to help, to help you, um, you know, go over the initial workflow. Once the original workflow it's established, things are getting uh, um, quite easy. There are also specific professionals from both Abbott and Dexcom who are important resources uh, that can uh, work with you and help you navigate this workflow and also troubleshoot uh, any um, errors um, in the initial steps. So let's, uh, uh, and then of course, this is an example of the CGM report that uh, is viewed um, on either online or in the office. This is an example of the LibreView, but uh, both the LibreView and the Dexcom generate the same type of data, this AGP report or ambulatory glucose profile uh, that we will actually go uh, 
quite in-depth uh, and review all these components with the summaries of the statistics of the various uh, glucose values and target ranges with the actual summary of the trends of all of these uh, usually um, 14 days and in fact uh, 30 days uh, tracings that can be uh, generated by the devices. Uh, we'd like also to mention that in addition to these specific platforms that have been developed by um, Abbott or uh, Dexcom respectively, there are also uh, additional um, more general platforms that have been developed that are in fact compatible not only with the two CGM that we've discussed, but with um, quite broad ranges of uh, blood glucose monitoring devices, in other words, the blood glucose meters, uh, as well as insulin pump. And here on the left, it's the Gluco platform. It's probably um, the most comprehensive uh, that it's uh, currently available and it, it can be used um, even as a in large healthcare system. Uh, allowing um, downloading uh, meters, pumps, uh, CGM, and here on the left, generating the same type of the reports, uh, including the AGP profiles and then the trends and patterns. And then on the right uh, is the Tidepool, another platform that also generates very beautiful and easy to follow reports, as you can see here on the right. However, there um, is a disclosure there are, as you know very well, uh, quite a lot of considerations that have to be um, uh, followed when one uh, uses uh, these uh, uh, web-based platforms where uh, private patient information is being shared. And there are some um, issues with the security setting with Tidepool. In general, this platform does not really follow all the guidelines with respect to security in preventing data breach. Um, and thus, most of um, healthcare system may not be able to use it. Uh, Gluco, on the other hand, uh, follows these uh, security uh, settings. However, it's quite expensive. So with that in mind, let's now move on and review all these components of the CGM report. And here is again the ambulatory glucose profile or the AGP report, as you will hear quite often. And um, um, this is the upper part of the report, which actually shows you the various statistics uh, with respect to the blood glucose uh, ranges. And I usually start looking here on the right, uh, and because it gives you in a nice color code uh, the time spent in various uh, glucose ranges with the target range shown here in green, which has been established between 70 and 180. And, you know, this uh, target range of 70 to 180, it is recommended to be uh, higher than 70% of the time. And that is based on uh, quite a few large studies uh, in which patients were compared with both um, wearing these glucose monitoring devices, measuring hemoglobin A1C and, and blood glucose meters. And it has been demonstrated that spending more than 70% in this target range of 70 to 180 corresponds practically to an A1C uh, of approximately um, uh, under seven. There are also very important components looking at the time spent in lower blood glucose or hypoglycemia, and we'll go over that as well, and then time spent in hyperglycemia. Here, these various target ranges on the left are being explained with the recommended times that um, uh, are uh, supposed to be reached in patients for optimal care, as well as giving you information on the estimated A1C based on, on the CGM glucose variability, as well as the time uh, uh, that um, included blood glucose to, uh, that were uh, calculated in this report. So here is a summary of the time in range in green always, the estimated target range. In red are the times shown in level 
one and level two hypoglycemia and same is in yellow and orange in hyperglycemia. And this timing range is now starting to be used in many large cohorts to understand uh, what is the actual impact and the future risk of developing complication. And, and definitely we are uh, collecting this data and uh, some initial um, evaluations and modeling uh, studies have shown that a 10% reduction in the time in range. In other words, less time spent in this green zone seems to be associated with an increased risk in um, complications, chronic complication. And I said, these are earlier, more like modeling studies, but um, th there are now ongoing studies looking specifically uh, at these new glucose targets. So let's get back now to the AGP report and um, go uh, through each component here on the right. As I said, I start with, with this right side because it gives me a very important information. And uh, at a glimpse, of course, we look at the green zone to see how far out are we out of the expected time spent in, in target range. Very importantly is to look first at hypoglycemia. And why is that? That's you very well know, uh, you know hypoglycemia can induce severe and very rapid complications, including coma. And very importantly, since we are talking about patients with type 2 diabetes who have additional comorbidities, as you very well know, uh, many have additional cardiovascular risk factors such as hypertension, hyperlipidemia, obesity. Uh, definitely in that setting, uh, hypoglycemia, particularly level two, could generate also arrhythmic events and other severe complications. Therefore, looking at the time spent in hypoglycemia initially is very important. And we know that this particular patient spends an uh, unacceptable high uh, time in hypoglycemia, 10% a day, which is more than two hours. So next uh, we look at how much time it's spent in level one and level two hyperglycemia. Um, and that is also quite um, important in, in the initial step. And that actually um, tells you from the very beginning that one, when one spends 10% in hypoglycemia, uh, definitely so much time in hyperglycemia, the glucose variability in this patient is pretty high, even before we look at the actual uh, trends and tracing. Uh, it's also very important to actually look to see how much time this particular patient used the CGM properly. So this report has been generated after 13 days. As I mentioned earlier, you could set up the report generating for 30 days if you, if you want, but it is important that the patient is wearing the CGM during that time to make sure that these statistics indeed reflect an accurate picture for a particular patient. And as you can see here, this is a very uh, good report because this patient is basically using the CGM all this time, shown here in active mode. And um, as I said, because of this continuous glucose monitoring um, algorithms that are being built um, in, in the technology, an estimated A1C for the duration of these 30 days for the glucose management indicator can be also calculated. And this is also uh, important when one may do virtual visits with, with patients when you cannot obviously do a point of care A1C in the office, but for documentation and also for your own information of the patients, you can also see what would be the actual A1C based on this recording. So the lower part of the report also gives you an opportunity to look at the actual trends in blood glucose. And uh, we discussed during the first lesson that here it's the median blood glucose and then the 75th and 25th confidence interval in darker blue, 95th and 5th confidence in lighter blue. 
this is also uh, giving you additional clue that will help you to make the best decision in the management of this patient. So what clue do we see here? So let's look in, in most importantly overnight. So we see that overnight there is a huge variability um, uh, with uh, blood glucose readings um, of under 50 and all the way to 350. But most importantly, we also see that the very vast majority of episodes of hypoglycemia in this case are happening overnight. This is even more important because during sleep, uh, people are much even less aware of low blood glucose and therefore more severe complication can happen. So that actually prompts you to really take some steps that will eliminate as much as possible the risk of dropping so much overnight. Uh, with that, you will also be able to narrow this high variability. Next, you see here this um, peak, large peak in blood glucose uh, in the early morning, which is definitely associated with food intake, likely breakfast. As we all know, traditionally, the Western diets have a pretty high intake of carbohydrates for breakfast, sometimes with other, without a source of protein to oppose some of their absorption. And that's actually pretty clearly illustrated in this trend. There is um, another uh, potential risk of uh, hypoglycemia here. So the rest of the episodes of hypoglycemia appear to happen uh, in the afternoon prior to dinner. And that could be uh, either because in this, this case, a patient may take some insulin or another uh, agent that can uh, cause hypoglycemia with breakfast or may engage in um, higher physical activities, not accounting for those when uh, taking a medication. And then with another peak after dinner. So that's actually an example of how much information can be generated by looking at the CGM report that can guide you in uh, decision making. And then of course you can also look day by day and sometimes actually I find this uh, components of the report very useful when I share this data with my patients. I always actually share when they are in person um, these reports with, with them and then we can understand perhaps some specific activities or, or meals or changes in the way that they were taking their medication on particular day that can explain either this peaks or actually um, low blood glucose readings. So to, summary, uh, to summarize this component, the AGP report, it's giving you a lot of information, including time spent in target range, very importantly, time spent in hypoglycemia, uh, the um, approximated A1C based on the glucose management indicator, the glucose variability, as well as all these trends. Here it's an example of the trends generated to the Dexcom G6. As you can see, uh, the data um, summaries are uh, very similar with the median blood glucose and 75th and um, uh, 25th and, uh, intervals, but then again, giving you the opportunity to understand whether there are some particular trends. Definitely here, the postprandial um, time, um, it's illustrated with a higher incidence of hyperglycemia uh, and with a even possibility to um, uh, discuss with patients some grazing uh, habits in uh, eating um, more um, uh, during the afternoon. Um, sharing, as I said, these uh, reports with patients, it's an additional very important component that can make them better understand effects of meals, activities, or medications and participate more actively to their management and become more adherent to the management. So let's go now over some patient example. And here is uh, an example of a patient who um, is seen in the office, uh, in the primary care office, has been seen in the primary care office, a real case. 
uh, BMI of 42, an A1C when seen of 7.5 here, and metformin, glipizide, and glargine. So here uh, is the initial CGM that has been placed on this participant uh, with um, the AGP report showing a 66% time in the desired target with some episode of hypoglycemia in the um, level one and level two, which are theoretically within the recommended um, levels under 4%, and with an average glucose of 155. Here are the actual trends with a um, trend of potential hypoglycemia here overnight, the only trend of hypoglycemia happening overnight, again, the uh, most dangerous time of having hypoglycemia, and then with this clear effect of, of postprandial readings. And here are also daily readings that one can evaluate. So this uh, patient, of course, uh, had been um, uh, discussing about uh, uh, changing lifestyles, uh, engaging in uh, uh, lower carbohydrates, more exercise, and uh, in order to also address the initial uh, trends in blood glucose, the clinical pharmacist uh, helped by reducing the glargine by 10 units, and here it is a month later, um, uh, we see already some improvement in the timing range with a clear blunting of this postprandial reading through changes in lifestyle um, and increase in timing range, although the incidence of hypoglycemia remains uh, pretty much the same. So this was a collaboration between the endocrinologist, the PCP and clinical pharmacist, um, I mentioned earlier uh, during lesson one, uh, this was this large mobile trial that we did together with primary care physicians and other uh, care providers involved in patient's care. Therefore, uh, recommendations were made to further decrease uh, insulin uh, and uh, discontinue a glipizide. And here we show you month by month uh, changes in uh, patient uh, continuous glucose monitoring uh, statistics and trends. Metformin is a uh, 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 glipizide, it's being stopped. Patients remain on metformin and, and glargine. Um, additional carbohydrates uh, are being cut. Uh, not surprisingly, you can see here this progressive blunting in the postprandial peak uh, that also allowed at, uh, to a progressive reduction in glargine dose um, and increase in time in desired uh, target range and actually elimination of the episode of hypoglycemia. And here we see a month six, very nice impressive reduction in glargine. Um, patient actually um, requiring a very low dose of glargine, no hypoglycemia, and almost no hyperglycemic peaks while adhering to this intervention of um, uh, lower carbohydrates, more physical activity, uh, and uh, metformin. So overall, uh, this uh, patient after eight months into the trial ended up with an average glucose of 120, an average GMI of 6.2, 97% time in uh, range um, with no episodes of hypoglycemia, lost 46 pounds in eight months, which is also impressive. Definitely, um, we now know that um, in addition to a low carb diet, particularly in a patient with type two diabetes and comorbidities, we have other options in, uh, in improving the uh, patient overall care and the overall uh, risk for cardio and renal complications with these newest agents like GLP-1 receptor agonists and uh, sodium glucose transporter inhibitors that you will also learn um, during our uh, collaborative lessons. 
uh, but definitely those are very important tools that are now available uh, that help with both glucose control and particularly with reducing their future risk. So another uh, important message is that with the help of this continuous glucose monitoring and technologies, uh, a team approach in, in patient management can be much more easily implemented as both physicians, PCPs, endocrinologists, clinical pharmacists can have access, they can work together and uh, um, you know, improve the therapeutic management. These patients can be even completely um, wean off insulin, uh, particularly with the addition of these new uh, agents that are now available. Of course, one needs to be quite uh, aware that if people are taking SGLT2 inhibitors, then the uh, very restrictive carbohydrates diet are not recommended. So let's review a couple of other examples that can help um, in medical decision-making and also that became even more uh, easy uh, to be identified with the CGM. And one is the DOM phenomenon. This is a physiologic phenomenon that uh, means an uh, increase in blood glucose levels in the early morning hours uh, given the uh, raise in several of the counter-regulatory hormones, such as uh, cortisol and some of the catecholamines that are basically having an opposing effect to insulin, as you know. So that's even in people who do not have diabetes, slightly higher blood glucose levels in the early morning are effect. But this has to be differentiated from the rebound hyperglycemia. And this is an example. Rebound hyperglycemia or the Shomogi effect is uh, an increase in blood glucose in response to a severe or even, uh, you know, level one hypoglycemic episode, particularly when it is um, extended over a longer period of time as seen here in this example. Again, also because our um, uh, system is really programmed to avoid hypoglycemia, then a um, reflex release of these counter-regulatory hormones can lead to increasing blood glucose, particularly when a patient may also consume carbohydrates to, to um, correct a hypoglycemic episode. In this particular case, as you can see here, the medication um, uh, regimen uh, included again, glargine and gliburide, another sulfonylurea, glargine at bedtime, gliburide twice a day. Uh, gliburide has a very high risk of inducing uh, extended uh, hypoglycemia because it has a very long half time and therefore the superimposition of gliburide with glargine here overnight could explain this um, sustained episode of hypoglycemia and that can guide your next management steps. So definitely in this case um, the gliburide was com uh, completely discontinued and, um, and insulin glargine was down titrated and one of these new agents, liraglutide, was added and as you can see here that has been associated with uh, a reduction and then complete eliminations of the nocturnal hypoglycemic episodes and also blunting these postprandial peaks. Here are examples again from other Another case uh, looking at um, uh, progressive down titration uh, of glargine with the addition of another uh, a different type of GLP-1 receptor agonist, the weekly dulaglutide, uh, together with um, lifestyle modifications uh, and dietary and exercise. And as you can see here very nicely, um, progressive uh, down titration of glargine is associated with uh, um, a reduction and then elimination of nocturnal hypoglycemia. A couple of uh, words about exercise. Um, exercise, of course, is a very uh, complex uh, process, particularly in patients with diabetes and particularly in patients with diabetes 
that are either completely insulin deficient, such as type 1, or patients with type 2 diabetes who have a more advanced stage of disease and require insulin because during exercise, in order for the muscles to generate the needed um, uh, energy uh, for metabolic um, uh, for metabolic processing one needs to uptake take the glucose out of of the blood and that is sometimes uh, very hard to do if not enough insulin it's on board so therefore uh, you may uh, have heard many times patients telling you well i wanted to exercise but doesn't make any sense you know i start with the blood glucose and after the exercise my blood glucose it's much higher so definitely that is possible because in an either uh, absolute or relative insulin deficiency this uptake in the muscle of the glucose it's not possible and then the body will need to generate additional sources of energy so that this gluconeogenesis or or the fat breakdown happens to generate uh, ketones that are another source of energy and then um, and then that could also increase indirectly blood glucose so exercise it's it's tricky but with the continuous glucose monitoring devices patients can understand trends they can see whether they start exercise at a relatively normal blood glucose level that would be less likely then to end with higher blood sugars afterwards or if there are trends of rapid decline during exercise they can correct by adding a small source of carbohydrates or reducing preventively any sort of medication such as insulin or sulfonylurea prior to exercise that can cause hypoglycemia. So those are again some practical examples and I'd like to end by um, discussing with you um, you know important information and codic billing and documentation. So here are the codes um, that will allow you to get reimbursed for the time spent in various activities. And we provide you here with Medicare uh, fees um, for both physician office uh, and outpatient diabetes center, as well as some of the private payers averages uh, and the uh, relative value unit um, generated for this activity. And as you can see here, it's the starting up fee of a patient on the CGM that uh, your team, usually either a diabetes educator or a diabetes nurse or, or a highly educated on CGM uh, medical assistant can do. Then there is the professional CGM uh, code um, uh, that can be done either as uh, for patients who do not have their own CGM yet, and you can use it, you can use your own CGM from the practice, generate reports and understand trends that can then be used for medical decision making. Uh, sorry about that. And uh, then the actual interpretation uh, that the physician has to do um, after the report it's generated and uploaded in the uh, EMR and the Medicare fee versus private payer fee. There are a variety of smart raises that have been already generated for you because obviously you need to document in your EMR um, that you have downloaded and then uh, have reviewed and uh, put the interpretation of the CGM. And here it's the Ep Epic and Cerner, the two most used EMR system. Um, and uh, here are the components that are being uh, followed by uh, payers, uh, demonstrating the actual statistics as well as um, trends. Uh, there are also smart uh, phrases that have been generated and we provide here for you in case you want to appeal um, a uh, decision of a pair of not covering the CGM. Here is the CGM justification, in which gives you all the components that are required to argue and uh, try to get coverage, as well as how to uh, continue to receive coverage uh, for a specific uh, patient. Um, we also want to um, um, highlight that uh, um, there are continuous 
effort to improve the way that this CGM data can be more easily incorporated into the EMR. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, currently these PDF reports are being generated and manually uploaded in most of the EMR. However, there are efforts, and uh, for instance here Abbott has been um, uh, working on rolling out a system where the AGP report can be automatically sent to EMR, but that is not uh, free of charge. That are currently cost of approximately 7,500. Uh, but then um, this um, field is evolving uh, every day. I mentioned earlier that there are also these third party platforms such as Tidepool and Gluco that once um, implemented in your practice will allow you to download multiple type of devices and you'll have those reports available uh, for uh, data view and medical decisions with the caveat that Tidepool does not have all the security settings required to avoid data breach uh, and Gluco is in fact expensive. And with that, I think that we are at the end of this presentation and I'm very happy to take any questions.